Okay, so the way I'm going to start to do the book club uh, breakdowns is this month I did Shoe Dog, which was for March. Uh, April is going to be Essentialism by Greg McCone. If you didn't get that in the email, uh, I sent out an email to the email uh, list. I'll put There's a link down below if you want to make sure you're on that. And I'm going to break them into three parts. The overall review, so what are my overall thoughts? High-level themes that I, like, I took away from the book, so what are the things that I really – uh, I'm just walking away with and what I'm remembering from the book and then some cool details that uh, that I just I either enjoyed in the book some and you know I could call those a lower level takeaways you got high level takeaways low level takeaways or cool details uh, so shoe dog like I said second time listening through it listened to it when it first came out and was just fascinated by it you everybody kind of knows the story of Nike or at least you know parts of it you know Phil Knight started it, and then the swoosh was developed by a graphic artist. Uh, and then uh, I, I didn't know anything about Steve Prefontaine or, or any of that stuff, but you, you kind of know the idea of Nike. I will also recommend the Business Wars podcast series. They just finished one on DC and Marvel. Fascinating uh, topic there. But they also did one on Nike versus Adidas or Adidas for Americans, and it – it covers things that aren't even really covered in the story. So it's a great companion piece to Shoe Dog because it covers a lot more modern stuff. And they don't they don't really get into the, into the Adidas rivalry in this book. They talk about the three designers that left and staged, uh, um, staged a coup in order to kind of steal trade secrets. Uh, but I would listen to Business Wars just to get a primer on this. And then Shoe Dog dives so much deeper than that. Uh, so, so my overall review... He stopped at 19. He did. Okay, so I'm going to get into that. So um, in the overall review, great recap of the early days of the Ni Nike. I think the narrator in the audiobook was good, so kudos to Audible. But Phil Knight is an excellent writer and storyteller, and you would assume that based on Nike's marketing prowess, but you do learn in the book that Phil Knight really isn't a marketer, and he wasn't that even that big of a fan of spending money on marketing. That really came from the team that he built up. Um, it, but it really – writes he, he really weaves together this personal and professional story of how he felt while things were happening and the decisions he was making while uh, he was building this company so i really really enjoyed the book my biggest problem with it and steve you just mentioned it in the chat is that it stops right as the good stuff happens it's so detailed from like 1950 to 19 he covers a little bit of the 80s and starts to get in some of the 90s, but it really ends at the Jordan era. It really ends right when I'm like, all right, now I can pick up the story because it happened when I was conscious. Uh, it was great to learn about the early days of Nike, but I want to know how, you know, they talk about him forming the partnership with Jordan. They talk about his relationship with these titans that he essentially built, which was Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan, but then it just ends. It's just like, what? And so, I thought about that a lot in the year that I listened to it. Um, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. The behind the scenes look at his personal feelings, the inner working of his company and the handling of employees. You really get to see like the voice of Phil Knight's head, which I really liked. Um, you know, there's the story that he's dealing with his very early sales rep. His sales rep is like is sending him letters every single day and Phil just doesn't respond. And he says, you know, I should have responded, but I didn't. And then it also talks about there's some meetings where he said, you know, in my head, I'm thinking I should say this, but I say nothing and I come off very cold. And so you see him kind of wrestling with his legacy and his perception in the book, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, but so yeah, it touches on these big relationships. And then there's this brief passage at the end where he starts to reflect on moving into a chairman role from the CEO role and the way that the company kind of slides as that's happening. Uh, and then he also talks about his son and his relationship with his son after or, or you know, his strained relationship with his family as he's building the company. And then uh, his son dies. And that is obviously one of the most tragic things in his in uh, to lose a uh, child obviously very traumatic, but for him, that was like one of the, the worst things and uh, it sent him into deep depression. And, and that's what um, he says in the book that, you know, with all the stuff that came out about Tiger, if anybody says anything negative about Tiger, uh, he will not have it because Tiger was the first one to reach out to him when his son died. So um, it's a good point. He might have stopped in 1980 to avoid controversy. He does touch on the manufacturing of the shoes uh, in Asia and sweatshops in the book. He makes the point that they never really talk about 
the fact that they left the factories in a much better place than they started, which is a fair point. Um, and the fact that Nike was the biggest manufacturer in all of those when everybody else was making, it's kind of like with Apple and Foxconn, it's like Apple's not the only company developing iPhones and, or manufacturing iPhones at Foxconn, it's all the electronic companies, but because they're the biggest, they get the most heat. And uh, so, yeah, that's a good point about 1980. Sorry if my tea, I'm making some tea, I'm, I'm making too much noise here. So that's my overall review. It's a fascinating book, especially if you are if you are into entrepreneurship and building a company, the way that you get to see both sides of the story, personal and professional, while also learning about one of the most iconic brands in the world is, is fascinating. Um, and so those are the, the you know, and it, but it ends too soon. Shoe Dog 2 might be really good because you get to learn about all the, the Jordan era stuff. But uh, so that is, that's the overall review. Now some high level themes that I really enjoyed in the book and some of the stuff that has really sat with me in the last year. Um, this was not a fluke in any way. Phil Knight was not a fluke in developing Nike. What it does come to show is that it's part hard work and it's also part luck or timing because the very, very much off the bat, Phil Knight is finishing his MBA and he's researching the, Jap the shoe market and he starts to learn more about the Japanese shoe market. So the Japanese camera took over from the Germans and his hypothesis was essentially, if that happened with cameras and technology, why couldn't it happen with shoes with the manufacturing expertise that the Japanese have? And so before Phil Knight left school, he knew he knew a, con a conceptual and academic understanding of the entire shoe market, which is what informed him to go into that market. Now, uh, there's a lot of hard work that comes after that, and but there's also this other passage that happens. This, this comes a little bit after he started Nike. Uh, Mr. Onitsuka, because that's who he originally distributed uh, through the Blue Ribbon name, he said, everyone wear athletic shoe all the time. I know this day come. And look at us today. Everybody wears athletic shoes. It happened. It just took a long time. But luckily, Phil Knight was able to capitalize on that shift because, you know, he was he was able to go through. So uh, all of the entrepreneurial stories where this guy was an overnight Instagram success and built this company or you know any of that stuff that you really read, there's always hard work behind it. They say it takes 10 years to create an overnight success. And this is absolute living proof that you know the biggest, most successful company in the world took a whole lot of hard work, but also timing was a key factor in this because you have the uh, casualization of footwear and the the increase in technology and manufacturing expertise that are required to build a company all happen at the same time. You just have to be there at the right time. So that was, that was a high level theme. Uh, the other one that had really stuck with me from the, the first time I listened to it and you know, he, he, he goes through it in great detail. That's my team. Uh, the company was constantly broke. Nike was founded, you know, blue ribbon, was started in 1963, I think is the first time that he really starts to buy shoes. And for 15 years, they he, Phil Knight could barely pay himself. He was floating the company on and got kicked out of two banks uh, for over 10 years. And today they're the most successful company in the world, but it took so much grinding and hard work to get there. What was the, uh, what was the saying in the book? Pay, pay the guy first, uh, whatever, the, the Japanese uh, banker, pay him first. Uh, I should remember that thing, but um, but the big turning point was in 1976. That was their big year. Steve Prefontaine led the Olympic trials. Uh, the Nike logo was born. The capital um, capital block letter Nike logo. They were doing tens of millions of dollars in sales, but they were still cash strapped. And at this point, they had been kicked out of two banks, and then they were hit by a 25 million dollar government bill. And that's right, there was no capital venture cap venture capital at the time. Uh, which is a point that he makes in the book. Today, you can go out and raise money fairly easily. Uh, back then, you just had to go to the banks. And so, uh, but even still, it's fascinating to hear hear that story. Um, I also believe that a key to a success, part of the high-level takeaways, is you need this like mentorship and expertise at the core of what you're trying to do. And for Phil Knight, that was Bill Bowerman. He was developing the, he developed the, the waffle design of the shoe. He was the one, he was essentially trying to create what tracks 
are built out of today, running tracks. And he was the one kind of tinkering away in the workshop. That's the, it's the Wozniak and uh, Jobs. It's the Balmer and Gates. You got to have the technical expertise along with the understanding of like scalability in business. Uh, hello from NYC. I'm in Fort Myers. Are we both Pittsburghers out of town? I don't know your name, Con Kong MW, uh, but if you message me on Instagram, then I'll, I'll figure out there. Uh, so that that mentorship key part of it. So uh, high level themes. I'll keep going there. You really get the sense that he regrets the way that he um, he didn't um, he didn't abandon his family, but the way he was not able to focus and spend time with his sons and his wife as he was building the company. And he really reflects on that towards the end of the book. And I think that's something to keep in mind as, you know, like I pour myself into my job today. I've been, I'm, I've been in Florida for the past uh, day. I'll be here for the whole week as part of my job. Uh, and, and the way that Phil Knight looks back on his relationship with his family at that time, I don't know that he would trade. It's hard it's not to say that he would trade the success that he has today for more time with his family, but I'm, I'm sure that he would uh, take that. From Nike to Mizuno. Um, uh, yeah, well, so part of that, uh, Go Aztecs mentions in the chat that you switched from Nike to Mizuno. Especially in those early years, Nike set itself apart on technology in the shoes. And a lot of runners today would argue that Nike is not the most technically advanced shoe. And and, and um, I run, I personally run in Asics. Um, I've run in Brooks in the past. And if you go to uh, big races, the big guys are all wearing like actual technical running shoes, not necessarily Nikes. And so that is one place where they've kind of lost their way. I believe I know they have the Nike running division. You can buy great running Nike running shoes, but amongst hardcore racers or runners, uh, you'll get brands like Hoka one, one or uh, Mizuno or Asics as like a real running shoe. And Nike is seen more as like a mass market casual shoe. Brooks most. Yeah. Brooks is, uh, I have some that I really like too, but, uh, yeah, I've run in Brooks in the past. What's the, I can't remember the, the name of the model that I used to run in. Um, and then the, the last high level takeaway, and then we'll talk about some of the cool details that I liked about shoe dog is, um, he mentions many times that they, he would just run to clear his head. So at a core, Phil Knight was a runner. He's a track runner. Uh, that was his entire life growing up. And there's many times in the book where he was frustrated about something or there's a business problem or he had a fight at work and he just went home and ran 10 miles. And it was like, that's constantly a theme in this book of like, this is a company that built technical footwear for runners and athletes. And at the heart of the company are athletes and, and, uh, runners. And so I just, I like that, 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 uh, piggybacking on the fact that you do have hardcore runners that run in uh, things are the Nikes. Uh, Nike was founded to great, make great shoes. Uh, and, and that's at the core of them. And so, yeah, Nike can sponsor athletes with the best of them. Uh, Nike to get back market share with generation Xers. I mean, Adidas has succeeded so far on nostalgia with the Stan Smiths and, and classic um, models. And you've got streetwear people, they're partnering with the right streetwear people. I don't know. If you listen to Business Wars and you listen to the Adidas Nike series in that, you'll see that um, you know Nike really has struggled since the early 2000s, since Phil Knight really stepped down. They haven't, uh, they haven't been nearly the same company. Uh, so some cool details about Shoe Dog that I just want to touch on. I, I got I made a ton of notes as I was listening this time. So that's part of why I started this book club is I used to listen to a bunch of books, but now I want to take what I've listened to and at least discuss it and talk about it a little bit more. I would love to make these more interactive where I could bring people in, but I haven't. I can't figure out how to do it on um, on uh, on Google Hangouts. Business Wars is corny. the The narrator is uh, the narrator is a little bit. Uh, eccentric or something but and they the ads uh oh, whatever but i i don't know i enjoyed business wars i like the netflix blockbuster one and uh it's inspired me to do a couple of videos that i'm working i got a lot of cool stuff i'm working on a lot of cool stuff but it just takes some time so some cool details uh phil knight travels the globe with his one green brooks brothers two button suit that's like his 
You know, if I'm going to go out to the opera in Paris or I'm going to this business meeting, he has a Brooks Brothers two button suit. And that was like his, you know, back then you had one, one suit. Uh, you didn't have 30 suits in your closet that are all custom made from internet companies. Uh, also, it's easy to forget how contentious the relationship with the Japanese would have been at that time. Uh, and, and he talks about that in the book is he's like, what, you're going to Japan? Uh, he talks about the devastation that he saw around Japan due to the war and to the bombings. And uh, so that was a chance. It took, he took a chance to go over there, you know, to build that company. And then, you know, that followed his uh, Phil Knight spent some time in Hawaii. He bought a one way ticket to Hawaii with his friend. Uh, they spent some time there. He sold encyclopedias, securities. And he eventually, um, be, you know, he, he eventually became an accountant, but uh, his friend that he went to Hawaii with ended up staying there. And, and then Phil went off and did the rest of the, the trip. And so uh, I thought that was, that, that's a funny detail is um, kind of the, the nomad way of, of traveling the world. Uh, when he did come back from that trip, his father was like, look, you have to get your, you have to be an accountant to get your CPA. So you have a floor on your salary. And I think that's still a thought that persists today is like, if you want to have a floor on your salary, you got to get X, Y, Z, you got to have a trade or, or have a, a degree or something. And, um, you know, it started back then. It's also interesting that it really is about who, you know, the reason that Phil, not the only reason, but a big contributing factor to how Phil Knight was able to get by in Japan and, and meet some of the people at Onitsuka and, um, and really develop that relationship is that Phil's father had friends that were expats living in Japan at the time, running an import magazine. And he was able to connect him and give him a little bit of tips on working with the Japanese. And so all about who, you know, build up that LinkedIn profile. Phil Knight is a very cultured man. All of the references in the book, when he, especially when he's back traveling through Europe, he was recreating or visiting places that, uh, that Voltaire or F Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway, all had you know significant uh, locations within Europe, and he wanted to go visit them. And he all, he talked about going to the the Parthenon. Uh, Panthe oh, geez, Greek. He, uh, he's into Greek mythology, but he's a very cultured guy, and that also plays into he starts telling his children stories before bedtime with Matt History being the main character, and so he tells stories of the founding fathers, and Matt History was there to help him along. And I just thought that was uh, that's pretty cool because you think of. You think of people that found, I always think of company people that found companies as these like monolithic and nebulous, not almost non-human people. But then you read something like this and you're like, same, same as you and me, just, just got lucky. Um, yeah. And he, he created Blue Ribbon as almost a farce because he wanted to buy shoes from Onitsuka and distributed those in the U.S. at first. That was in 1963. Uh, Bowerman being, I talked about this before, but Bowerman really is at the core of what essentially propelled Nike into the stratosphere. He was co-owner. He had 49 to 51% of the company, 49 Bowerman, 51% Phil Knight. Um, but he was the one that was developing the technology and Im improving the shoes and gave Phil Knight the confidence to say, if we go out on our own, you know, Onitsuka isn't taking our design improvements seriously. So if we go out on our own, develop our own shoe, Bowerman can help push that forward. And so, um, you know, Bowerman is a, is a, seems like a name almost lost to, to the, uh, to the history of Nike, but you really see that in this book that he was critical. And then I love this. I guess I missed this story last time. <laughs> uh, thank you, Aztecs. Um, this I, I must have missed it in the last one, but the Nike Cortez is named that because um, they were trying to, to name a shoe for Onitsuka, and they wanted to name it the Aztec. And I can't remember the exact story. I think Adidas had something close or similar to that name, and they threatened to sue Nike if they created the Aztec. And Bowerman said, "What was the you know? What were the guys that?" kick the Aztecs ass and Phil Knight says the Cortez and uh, that's how they got the Nike Cortez. Um, you get a glimpse into Phil Knight's negotiation, uh, hard headedness tactics when he talk about the stock price and he like really hard lined at going public at $22 a share. That was like a very big point of pride for him. And, and that was really how he uh, 
you know, it shows how we hard lined on that. You can kind of look at the different decision points and deals that happened through the history and just apply that frame and be like, look, he was a hard headed guy. He knew what he wanted and he knew how to get it, even if it, uh, it took some coercing. Um, I didn't realize that Nike had a huge fiasco with their apparel line launch. So they had to recall a lot of items and it was a, a very big stain on the company at the time. Uh, and it cost them a lot of money. And then finally, the book is actually a circular narrative, which at the end of the book, um, you know, Phil Knight is essentially like, oh, uh, you know, I should probably write this down, think about the story. And then he, is, he almost like starts the book over. And so the, the book itself is a circular narrative. And uh, I found that pretty interesting, although not necessary, but it was it was interesting the way that it panned out. And so that is Shoe Dog. Overall, high level, some cool details. Uh, if you guys read the book and you want to have a couple of things you want to drop in the chat uh, that you want me to talk about, I can do that. If you have any questions, uh, that is the book club this month. Like I mentioned in the beginning, Essentialism by Greg McCone is going to be the April book. I'm going to start that tomorrow. It's a quick six and a half hour listen on Audible. Uh, I'll probably be able to finish that by the end of this week. And I'll try and stream in April this time instead of um, 10 days after the month ends. Um but any suggestions on the book club, what I would like to do too, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out the format for the live streams to make this a little bit more digestible and a little bit more actionable. And then I think I'll also put together more of my notes in outline form and maybe I'll email these out to the group. Um, I really like, I listen to the investors podcast, TIP network, and they do um, the notes like this. And I think that would be uh, helpful to you guys, helpful to me to force me to sit down and work on this stuff and uh you guys always want sh clothing checks this is state and liberty it's coming you guys asked for it and then i put the nato on today or this week and uh i really like the nato because i wanted to order they have the custom nato booth in paris where you can engrave like the nato straps and i really wanted to get one uh, so i was like i'll, I'll put the